As you just introduced, I'm uh, Winston. I'm product manager in Google Cloud with Richard. Uh, I'm a senior engineer on Google Kubernetes Engine. Cool. Yeah, thanks for joining our session. We'll talk about using TPUs uh, through Kubre. Um, so as we're all witnessing, we're definitely in a new evolution of AI where large ML models are demonstrating human-like capabilities. This is opening up a whole new uh, opportunities to apply AI, AI in real-world use cases that weren't available before. Uh, one of the dimensions driving those new capabilities is the expanding size of these ML models. Over the past five years or so, they've been growing 10x year over year. That's an order of magnitude. Part of that is driven by AI uh, compute accelerated capabilities. But in turn, it's also driving increased demand for that accelerated compute. Uh, for decades, Google has been a leader in machine learning. Uh, and we've been serving these type of models inside YouTube, Maps, and Search, all the way from the original innovation that is the seed for all of Gen AI with the transformer. To do so, we had to custom design our own chips to deliver this global scale performance. So enter left, TPUs. As uh, we just announced it next, that we now have TPUs V5E in preview. Um, and so this further enables customers to pursue these transformative opportunities in AI ML the same way Google has done for our own products and services. The two main benefits that we expect customers to enjoy out of using TPUs is one, efficiency, and two, scalability. So the first one, efficiency. Ooh, I can't see the chart from there, All right, sorry. Um, so here we have a chart demonstrating the performance of the recent TPU V5e over the previous generation. On the y-axis, you have the relative inferences per dollar. By relative, the V4 is normalized to one, and then we show the improvement performance with the V5e. And um, across the horizontal axis, you can see it demonstrated across a variety of the different Gen AI models. And so you see a range of actually a 1.7 to 2.5x improvement in the relative inferences per dollar. And so, you know, like many things in these days, it's really about that performance per cost and optimizing what you can deliver there. Uh, the second aspect is scalability. So TPUs are designed with a special topology and high-speed interconnect such that each chip can expand and act in unison. Um, that allows you to serve from medium models to super large, the largest of models. Uh, as you can see in the table there, one TPU V5e chip can serve a 13 billion parameter model. And then you can seamlessly scale all the way up to 256 chips, which can go on the order of a 2 trillion parameter model. So, you know, the largest of the large. Um, furthermore, you, we also have multi-slice technology, which enables near linear scaling all the way up to tens of thousands of chips. Great, so now that you understand some of the benefits our customers are appreciating by leveraging TPUs, uh, Richard, can you tell us about some of the differences in using TPUs? All right, thanks, Winston. So uh, as we just learned from Winston, uh, TPUs give you uh, high levels of efficiency and uh, scalability. So I'm gonna explain a few ways that uh, TPUs are different from traditional GPU workloads. Uh, so when we think of uh, GPU workloads, right? GPUs are individual devices attached to VMs. So what that means is you can have a VM, and a VM can have uh, some number of GPUs uh, attached to it, like uh, up to 16 GPUs, right? So what does that mean when you're trying to schedule workloads, uh, Kubernetes workloads, on the uh, uh, GPUs? Uh, what you do is you, you have uh, worker pods that uh, reserve some number of GPUs that are on uh, that VM. And if you're using time sharing or something like that, you can even uh, share a GPU across uh, multiple uh, different workloads. Uh, for TPUs, it's a little bit different. So uh, we have a, a really uh, simple diagram here. So imagine you're looking inside the TPU, right? Uh, inside each one of those boxes, uh, you will see uh, four chips connected to a single host uh, connected by ICI, which is an uh, inner chip interconnect. And in Kubernetes, when you're scheduling workloads, each of your workloads 
uh, is going to be on a pod, and the pod is going to reserve all the TPU chips attached to a host. And um, we heard from Winston that uh, you can use a uh, multi slice uh, to connect together TPUs, right? So what does that look like? So in this picture, you can see that uh, we have several TPUs connected together with uh, high bandwidth memory, and that's how it's able to achieve that uh, high throughput. Uh, so in uh, Google Kubernetes engine, each of these corresponds to a node pool. And when you create this node pool, you must allocate this node pool with a specific topology type. Uh, for example, in this case, what we're seeing is a uh, two by two by four, which is the uh, total number of uh, chips and uh, TPU hosts. And um, so this also means that uh, each of your TPU hosts must be aware of its own environment, like its own index and uh, then the host names of uh, all the other hosts in the TPU slides. Uh, so we'll come back to uh, this point in a little bit. Uh, so we went over the architectural difference uh, architectural model, right? Um, another major difference is the programming pattern. So typically, typically GPUs access chips through low-level libraries like CUDA. Uh, for <coughs> TPUs, uh, we access chips through a higher-level compiler like uh, XLA. And um, using XLA ha comes with a bit of a trade-off. Right? So the advantage is that uh, it does a lot of optimizations for you. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, it's uh, less customi customizable. Um, in addition, TPUs mostly run with a multi-controller model, which means that uh, if, if you uh, imagine what you don't have a uh, workload orchestrator, uh, what that means is that uh, you must uh, SSH into each of your hosts and make sure that the same workload is running. And finally, we have the, a difference in the ecosystem. So GPUs have been around a lot longer. So uh, as a consequence, it has a more comprehensive ecosystem of uh, ML frameworks. So those are a few ways in which TPUs are different from GPU workloads today. Now, what we are trying to solve is to make the TPU experience mirror GPUs as much as possible. Uh, so now Winston is going to talk about a yeah. few ways that uh, we can make that happen. Awesome, so we heard about some of the benefits that customers get out of TPUs, uh, but that does come with some of the differences in managing it. So you get that optimized performance, you get the scale, but it's a slightly more complex topology. Kubernetes helps you manage complex deployments. Um, it's a trusted standard for deploying, operating, and monitoring really any type of application. Um, furthermore, it has a robust ecosystem of OSS tools uh, that are both mature and really apply to any workload, which you know, obviously where Ray comes in. Uh, Ray just offers a delightful experience data scientists love. Uh, it provides that simple interface such that you can build, deploy, and manage your ML workloads across distributed compute, right? It abstracts away the resources, so you just don't need to worry about that. Um, and ultimately, we see this in almost three layers, right? You have your infrastructure, your TPUs, so strong performance there, and then Kubernetes to have you know, your scalable orchestration and reduce the complexity in your deployment. Then lastly, Ray, to really simplify and give you that great experience uh, to d distribute your applications. Uh, uh, and so how do you actually run the Ray onto TPUs? So, uh this is sort of a uh, simple mental picture of uh, what a Ray on uh, TPUs cluster should look like. Uh, so here we have a, a number of uh, four Ray workers. Each is um, on a different Kubernetes pod. And as mentioned earlier, each pod is uh, deployed directly on a TPU host, uh, which means that, that they reserve all the TPU chips that are on that host. Uh, so uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, if, if we have a uh, multiple host uh, topology, uh, each of the workers must, uh, first of all, th they must have a unique index, and second, they must uh, know the uh, host names of all the other hosts that are in the same uh, topology. So uh, here we have an example of uh, this, uh, this last worker in this, uh, this TPU cluster. It has uh, a worker ID 3 set to it, and uh, 
it sh should also be initialized with the host names of uh, all the other hosts in the same topology. And we'll see later how uh, Kubernetes makes uh, uh, make all this uh, possible. Uh, so here's a, a, a sample workload of uh, how you run uh, use uh, Ray to schedule workloads on uh, TPUs. Um, so as mentioned earlier, uh, TPU uses a multi-controller model where the same program must be running on all the hosts. So instead of uh, SSH into each host and running the same code, uh, we can just have a single driver program. Uh, here is this, uh, we define a simple function uh, that uses uh, JAX, and uh, each uh, that the function uh, reserves uh, a number of uh, TPU resources. And we can send uh, non-blocking calls to each worker to schedule the workload uh, on all the workers. And then this would produce the, uh, the output that we want. So now we're going to walk through of how this works end to end. Uh, this is a, a very simple uh, Terraform snippet. Um, this uh, talks to Google Kubernetes engine uh, to provision a TPU node pool with a specific topology type. Uh, behind the scenes, Google Kubernetes Engine will spin up the VMs, uh, create the node pool, and installs the TPU drivers and device plugin on the worker containers. So next, we're going to use uh, Kubray to make the user experience for provisioning the cluster as uh, straightforward as possible. Uh, so here what we see is a, uh, a Ray worker spec. So this is just a part of the, the full Kubray spec. Uh, in this uh, snippet, we can see that uh, we're initializing the worker by declaring the number of TPU resources that's uh, available on each worker. Uh, so at, uh, after the next uh, Ray release, we are planning to make TPUs a natively supported resource. So this step should, uh, in the future, ideally, this should no longer be necessary. Uh, here, what we're doing is uh, we're, uh, this should be look familiar to, uh, if you have used uh, Kubray. So instead of reserving the number of GPUs, we just say the, the number of uh, TPU chips uh, that we're requesting for each worker. And finally, uh, since we are deploying this on a specific topology, we need to specify the topology type in the, uh, uh, the node selector. So th this will ensure that uh, the workload will get uh, scheduled on a node pool with a specified topology type, as well as the accelerator type. Uh, so when your cluster is up and running, you can uh, just uh, submit a, a simple workload and uh, specify the number of TPUs that you need. Uh, in this case, we have a stable diffusion. Uh, this, is, this is basically just a, a code snippet. And um, you can use a raise serve uh, to declare the, the uh, actor options uh, and specify the number of replicas, as well as the amount of resources required for each replica. So uh, if you have followed along, we mentioned earlier that uh, we are uh, in, in the multi-host environment, uh, the worker hosts must be initialized with the, the uh, worker index as well as the host names. So what do you do if you're trying to run this uh, on GKE? Uh, so currently, we, will, we publish this little code snippet that would uh, help you initialize. Uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, before you initialize the JAX environment, uh, you should get the, just, just send some code to get the host name for each uh, TPU worker, and then uh, use, uh, just use some, some Python code to set the environment variables. And then after this point, uh, you, should in, uh, you can initialize JAX, and uh, the, lib, the TPU uh, libraries will be initialized with the correct uh, environment settings. Uh, so now I want to shift gears a little bit. So we've talked a bit about how to uh, run a Kubernetes cluster with TPUs, right? But if you're running a 
uh, if you're trying to operationalize a machine le learning workload in, the, in your environment, uh, most likely you ha have a number of uh, uh, general issues to solve, right? For example, uh, if, you're, if you're using this uh, in uh, your own environment, you may want to enable um, authentication to protect your Ray cluster endpoints, right? Uh, you may want to monitor what's going on in your deployment somehow, like uh, check out uh, the logging, like you see, if you need to debug a job. Um, maybe as a system administrator, maybe you want to uh, look at the system as, from a, a broader uh, point of view and uh, look at the metrics, general metrics, like what, what, what are my uh, resource utilizations? What's, uh, what's the memory consumption, right? And finally, as a um, ML researcher or an engineer, uh, you want some ways to uh, run experiments or just, just to experiment with uh, your Ray cluster. So, right, so there's a number of uh, integrations that you may need. So to make uh, this process easier, we have published uh, a, a set of Terraform templates that will help the users uh, get started with uh, Ray on GKE. So this uh, comes out of the box uh, with uh, installations for a GPU or TPU enabled uh, GKE cluster. Um, it comes uh, with a Kubernetes operator that you can use to deploy the workloads that we have just described. Uh, there is a IAP enabled endpoint. Uh, IAP stands for identity aware proxy. So this enables uh, you to uh, authenticate to your Ray cluster uh, using your Google uh, credentials. Uh, there is uh, built-in support for cloud logging, so you can go to the cloud, log, uh, cloud console to view your uh, logs. And there's uh, Prometheus monitoring to help uh, look at the metrics. And in addition, we have installed a Jupyter Notebook server to make uh, experimenting with the Kubernetes cluster uh, very straightforward. So uh, yeah, you can uh, check out the user guide on this uh, GitHub link. Yeah, right. obviously you can't click on the link, yeah. but if you just did like Google search GitHub Ray on GKE, you'll pop into a uh, GitHub site that is all our AI and GKE uh, templates, best practices guides and things like that. So definitely encourage you to check it out um, and reach out to us through there. Cool. So presentation is no fun without a demo. Um, what we're going to demo is Stable Diffusion, which is a, if you're not familiar, a popular um, text to image generation algorithm. Uh, we're using a Stable Diffusion, this version V1.4 from Hugging Face. Uh, so hopefully this will switch seamlessly. All right, now how do I, where is it? Is it playing? Can't see the little mouse cursor. Am I there? There, you got it. Am I there? Yeah. There, all right. Richard's all right. gonna offer a voiceover. Yeah, so I'll just narrate this. Um, so this is uh, uh, done using the Terraform templates that uh, I just uh, introduced. So we're just going to run this deployment. I hope this still works. Oh, it's a recording. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so now we're going to... Um, Clearly unedited, so this is real. Yeah, this is <laughs> definitely real. Uh, so yeah, we're, uh, this, this will deploy a, a one Ray cluster with a single worker. And that's so we could save capacity for customers. Oh, so the, uh, here we're looking up the uh, IP for the uh, Jupyter Notebook server, so we can use it to experiment. Uh, there we go. So first, we're going to pip install the uh, Ray in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, this should take about a minute. Yeah, oh, there we go. Okay, now we're going to scroll down. Scroll down, <laughs> see? Um, so uh, in the next cell, we're, uh, so notice how we're uh, talking to a Kubernetes uh, service endpoint. Uh, this is because this notebook server is, is deployed in the same Kubernetes cluster. 
uh, we're going to install uh, some a bunch of libraries on the Ray workers. Uh, next, we're going to uh, this is an ingress class. Uh, so th th this is this basically can run on any infrastructure. So uh, this is where we specify the actor for the uh, for the replica. And uh, we're going to, yeah, this is just starts the serve instance. So now we're going to uh, take a look at the, uh, the jobs from the uh, RAID dashboard. Uh, you can see that this job is running now. So yeah, everything looks good. You can also look at the logs if we need, but. Okay, so we have the serve running. Uh, so now we're going to actually send a request. Uh, you can see that uh, because we're, uh, we, we're using the same uh, instance, we're just uh, going to send the inference request to the same endpoint. And uh, you can see below that we're, uh, uh, this is a list of prompts that we're going to generate. And set. It's going to finish in a second because this. There we go. So, yeah, so we're going to look at the results. Yeah, these are the uh, pictures that we generated from, uh, from our prompts. Cool, yeah. Uh, with that, uh, we'll open the floor to questions. Don't really want to jump back to the presentation, but it's basically Q&A. <laughs> so, so for the classes, is there a CPU to this? Maybe we'll jump back to this. Yeah. Uh, when you monitor the rate, is it? Oh, the, the usage? Yeah, is there a CPU option to CPU? S not yet. <laughs> Yeah, just a quick question for your TPU instances. Do you also have something similar to what uh, EC2 does, like spot and reserved, and you know, at different price points? Sure. Is it different price points for different TPU shapes? No, no, like spot, spot, and reserved. Oh yes, there, there's spot available for TPU. And then as reserved. Well. Can you look ahead and reserve? And you can do reservations. Okay. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. And just curious, will ever be TPU shortage on GCP? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me follow up with you on that. <laughs> yeah. hey, um, so, comparison to uh, GPUs uh, for training and for serving, do you have you compared the performance with TPUs? And simple answer is yes, but a lot of it will come uh, different to models. So it's not like it's one is necessarily better than the other for every single model. Um, and then a lot of it is, like what we talked about is price per, or performance per price. Um, so I would say like it, it's gonna come down to different use cases and, and what you're doing. Uh, but you know, happy to follow up and work with you to compare what your exact use case is. Cool, thanks. Um, have you, what's the largest uh, pre-training model you've done on TPU just as part of your experimentation? I mean, so we don't specifically do the AIML. We enable customers and also internally do AIML. Um, internally, I think publicly we've announced 1.6 trillion often, but I think there was one paper that was like 2.1 trillion. Um, publicly, that's what it is. And I'll say internally, there's always more. I think we're trying to serve one of the Llama models. You mean, for us? Well, yeah. I, so obviously with GK, we are enabling customers with production workloads. Um, and I'd offer that in many cases, the largest of the large model isn't quite there to production. Uh, but we definitely scale. We, we have the largest scale of publicly known um, size of clusters for size of models. 
Um, I think there's blog posts out there. I'm being very careful with words. If not, they will be there soon. <laughs>